looking forward to having all of you here. Um, thank you uh, for being a part of tonight. And I'll, I'll hand off to Olivia Lemberger, our innovation design strategist. Thank you so much, Ori. So tonight we're going to be learning from two innovators how nurses are leading disruptive models to impact underserved populations and how they've joined forces to scale these efforts across the country and deeply impact social determinants of health and transform communities. I'd like to introduce Lauren Hardin. Lauren is a nationally recognized leader, highly skilled at partnering with communities, health systems, and payers to co-design models and interventions for complex populations. She most recently served as senior advisor for the Camden Coalition's National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs. Hardin's past work includes developing an award-winning complex care model that creates better patient navigation, decreased hospitalizations and costs for vulnerable populations. The model was recognized as an exemplary practice in the National Academy of Medicine's Future of Nursing Report 2020 to 2030. I'd also like to introduce Paul Leon. Paul is the CEO and founder of Illumination Foundation, a grassroots nonprofit organization whose mission is to disrupt the cycle of homelessness. Illumination Foundation provides stable housing and wraparound services to homelessness homeless families through its programs. Mr. Leone also pioneered Illumination Foundation's recuperative care and medical respite program to manage the discharge of homeless patients from hospitals. So at this time, we invite you to begin your presentation. Thank you to Lauren and Paul. Thank you so much, Olivia. We're both very excited to be here tonight and share with you some of the things we've learned in developing innovation and scaling it, and also really interested in hearing your comments and questions. So Erin, if you'd start the slides, um, we're going to talk tonight about building connected communities of care, really integrating healthcare and homeless service delivery, as well as addressing social determinants of health and vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. I learned the most about what mattered from Jesse. Jesse was a gentleman that was referred to me when I was running a complex care center model that I had developed. And he had more than 50 emergency room visits across the city at three different hospitals. He had many different care managers. He was intersecting with multiple systems. And he wrote me a letter to explain what was happening for him. And it went like this, why I went to the emergency room, loneliness, desperation. The emergency room is like grandma's house. The lights are always on. Someone's always home. And I knew you would do the right thing for me, even when I didn't know what to do. Jesse taught me that often we think the hospital and the emergency room is for medical care, but really in a lot of the settings that we work, people are coming to us for so much more. And it's really important to consider that as we're looking at whole person care and how we develop and deliver what we do. Next slide. As I got to know Jesse better, I realized he was interacting with so many different systems. He was homeless. He had a behavioral health diagnosis. He had a doctor. He had a site case manager. He had um, police involvement in, in what was happening for him. And he also had really significant trauma. He'd been in jail. He'd gotten divorced. He'd lost access to his children. So many things were happening for him. And what he needed was integration. So as part of my work in that model, I reached out across systems, invited everyone to a shared table, even competitors, even people we didn't think of as part of the delivery system like EMS. And we worked together to develop an integrated plan for Jesse. We integrated that in the medical record and then worked together to help people understand his whole story and what an integrated approach would look like. Because he got consistent, because he was seen as a whole person, he ended up getting stable. He got housing, he got off substances, 
and he was actually able to reunite with his kids. He was a great teacher about what we might want to think about as we look at models going forward. So from the experience with Jesse, next slide, and many others, uh, I developed a model called the Complex Care Center. So I developed a model that was really nurse driven. We did a very comprehensive consultation for anyone that was referred to our service that included a whole person story, including social determinants, what was happening medically, but also behaviorally, and also what was breaking down in the system. We connected people across sectors to do integrated plans of care. We put those in the electronic health record. So the rest of the team 24 seven could be informed by that. And then from what we learned from individual patients, we worked on process improvements in the system. A lot of people were unstable because our system was broken, not because they weren't trying to get well. So we worked on that. And then we learned very quickly that we needed to convene community collaboratives to work on deeper root causes like housing, food security, and transportation. So that center was able to care for many, many people. We did an analysis of outcomes on more than a thousand patients. And what we saw in that cohort was a 44% decrease in inpatient and ED visits, a 23% return on investment. And that was an analysis done by a large health system finance department. And we saw improvements in quality of life, housing and access to insurance. So nurse-led intervention focused on collaboration really made a difference. Next slide, please. So I had the opportunity within, that was in Trinity House. I had the opportunity to scale that model to multiple systems and then um, see what the impact was in rural environments and urban environments. And then went on to work with the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs. And when we were preparing this presentation, <laughs> I was a little shocked to discover I've actually had the privilege of partnering with more than 30 states and communities to scale those principles in populations like homeless populations, justice involved, behavioral health, value-based payment in older adults, and really focused on cross-sector and community collaboratives and ecosystem build with different partners, payers, states, health systems, counties, and very small, completely isolated community-based organizations in very rural areas. A lot of diverse experiences. I wanted to share quickly two stories of um, places that adapted that original motto. Next slide, please. So one place was Project Restoration in Lake County, California, Northern California, rural, highly under-resourced. 75% of the affordable housing had burned in wildfires. They had a lot of issues with substance use, under-resourced workforce issues, a lot of complexity. And when we started working together, they really had zero services for the homeless, even though they had a large homeless population. So we built a cross-sector collaborative that included the police, fire, EMS, the mayor, who's uh, Russ on the right, <laughs> health, social services. We shared data to understand who are their most vulnerable community members, <clears throat> and then how could we work together to help them individually, and then work on community process improvements. Next slide. So they went from basically having no homeless services to building out an entire ecosystem by listening to the clients and intervening individually, but also working on system change. They now have transitional housing, multiple shelters. They have um, a whole integrated system with employment. They have substance use navigators and access to behavioral health. Um, all of these things just keep growing and growing because of that core original approach. Next slide, please. So these are the outcomes they were able to generate. And this is on more than 683 patients. Again, you see very similar impacts to the first model I described. It's using those same principles. Reductions in unnecessary visits, 
also reductions in costs to community services like EMS and the justice system. And then also improvement in value-based payment, so capitation financial performance. They also had positive um, connections across the community and meaningful relationship build and improvements in quality outcomes for the clients. That generated almost $10 million in follow-on investment because so many people have been excited by the work. There's a link in here to a, a short video about where you can hear directly from one of the clients and also a peer reviewed article with details about this model. Next slide, please. So that, that framework that started in that original model is really understanding um, the data about the population in a community, pulling together a cross-sector collaborative to work on it, understanding what are the strengths here and what are our opportunities? How can we work on specific um, interventions and process improvements in the community? And then how can we actually work on build that actually changes root causes for populations? Next slide. So one other place I wanted to share with you is Memphis, Tennessee. So I had the opportunity to work there with Regional One in developing the One Health program using the same principles as that original model. And two new nurses there, Susan Cooper and Megan Williams, were key in developing that and implementing it. We um, focused on the uninsured population. Tennessee did not expand Medicaid. So they had a tremendously large population of people with no insurance, tremendous impacts of poverty. And also like heartbreakingly, as we got deeper into reaching out to the people is they actually qualified for benefits or they actually qualified for services, but they didn't know how to access them. It was no one's job to help them do that. What happened by reaching out to the population is they um, saw an $11 million reduction in costs in the population and a $16 million gain for the health system who was serving a very vulnerable population and really had no margins. So effective financial management was important. We got people disability, we got people access to um, pharmacy benefits, to actual insurance. And we built more than 200 community partnerships to address social determinants of health, like rapid access to housing, transportation, behavioral health, substance use disorder. Those same principles, nurse-led, whole person focus, innovation, focus on building connectivity across the community, resulted in tremendous outcomes that are still going on today. There's a link to a video where you can hear from a patient in this model. And also there's a health affairs article about this model that you can reference. Next slide. So I had the privilege um, three years ago to be at a dinner with Paul. So Paul had won the Purpose Prize from AARP, which is a national level recognition about innovation and social determinants. And at that time was the AARP Culture of Health Scholar. So we were speaking together at a conference. And as we started to talk, I realized this was the first time I was meeting another nurse innovator, another incredibly innovative leader that our models paired up so well and could make a tremendous difference for so many people. So we went on, next slide after a pause from the pandemic <laughs> where we weren't getting together to develop national healthcare and housing advisors. And our team is focused on really collecting the best people who have deeply implemented and delivered care to vulnerable populations and our experienced consultants. And what we're doing now is having the opportunity to scale this work nationally. I'm gonna turn it over to Paul for him to talk with you about the model that he developed. Next slide. Thank, thank you, Lauren. That food, every time I see it, makes me hungry. Um, so I, we're gonna talk a little bit about the models that we had used, um, but I want to go back a little bit to talk about Illumination Foundation. That was a nonprofit that we really started as a grassroots um, nonprofit um, and actually at my kitchen table. 
And I was an ICU nurse, ER nurse, and had dealt with vulnerable populations, but not to the extent of, of public health and not to the extent of really being in the community and, and really link them to services. So when I started Illumination Foundation or found it 15 years ago, we were a little bit naive. Um, I was not the person you'd pick to run a, a nonprofit, which eventually became a $50 million nonprofit. Um, I, I didn't even know what an MOU was. Um, I really didn't know what a nonprofit was and did, um, but I learned real fast. And so one of the areas that we saw what was really the, the problem was that Lauren alluded to it a couple of times, is really integrating the services. Everything that I had saw in the community was really siloed. So, you know, you would have a person, John Doe or Jane Doe, and they would go to the ER, they were discharged, and they probably weren't follow up with their primary physician. And sometimes they would hit an FQHC or they would go to another ER and it was really fragmented, not to mention any of the, the uh, EMRs were, you know, consistent. And so it was really difficult. Um, we were really looking for somebody who had an integrated system and we didn't find that. And so we, we built it ourselves. And basically what we, we did is we took street to home and took somebody who was out on the street, unsheltered, and moved them through a continuum to go into permanent housing. So what you see in front of you is basically um, somebody who's on the street, we would uh, do street medicine or mobile engagement, and then move them into a medical respite or a family emergency center, and then into a micro community, which is a little bit of transitional housing, and then into permanent housing. And so it took us quite a few years to build this whole system. But it, the unique thing about it is that when you look at the bottom part of it, this was prior, in California, we have something that's really um, unique uh, that we have a, a cat, it was called Cal A. It was 1115 waiver that we were able to now get funding for this whole process. But 15 years ago, we didn't have that funding. So we had to be really creative, use county city funding, use the hospitals and um, some of the payers to pay for the stay in medical respite. And then of course, we had to get really good at using HUD. So the funding source is on the bottom, but what's not on this, um, continuum is the top part. We have an integrative system that can track somebody through this whole program. So we can look at a client and know what type of housing they're in, um, what type, you know, had they come through recuperative care, and we can see everybody who touched them, including when they're in housing. So this was a couple of our attempts at, at uh, street outreach. We actually had a, a really large comprehensive street outreach team. And what we kind of learned was that, yes, you could deliver care um, out, you know, where people were in parks, beaches, cars, and riverbeds, but it wasn't sustainable. Um, we had four or five large medical vans. Um, we would do a, a day, on a weekend where we would see sometimes up to a thousand patients in one day and do all dental, vision, mental health, all in one setting. But then you really needed to connect people to somewhere because you would it was hit and miss if you saw them again. And so about that time, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with medical respite, recuperative care, we had called it recuperative care. Nationally, it was, it was medical respite. Um, but basically, somebody who's discharged from the hospital.
comes to one of our facilities. We do wraparound services and the social determinants of health are, are really stressed in these, um, in these settings. And if you look at, you know, the models, there's everything from a, you know, just a, a motel to a hospital. We actually have two medical respites that are in the hospital to our navigation center and recuperative center, which was our flagship uh, center. It's the one on the left. And we're gonna show you a quick one minute video on how we put this all together. Downstairs is a shelter. Upstairs are all the social determinants of health that we address. Welcome to the Fullerton Navigation Center. This center was designed to be a bridge from the street to sustainable housing and accessible health care. The location has 90 beds on the navigation side and an additional 60 beds on the recuperative care side. The facility offers case management, behavioral health therapy, and more for our most vulnerable. Clients access our lobby area through the back gate where they will be greeted by one of our friendly site ambassadors and checked in by security as they commence COVID safety protocols. During the intake process, the client will meet with the case manager to assess their needs. The client will then be shown the activity area and the resource room on his or her way to their door, where a bed, toiletries, and a dresser are awaiting them. We also supply lockers and a space for pets outside. Our dining room is the heart of our center, where clients meet not only for their meal periods throughout the day, but for activities and a gathering space for site updates and Q&A with staff. On the other side of our facility is our recuperative care. Our recuperative care program is designed to provide safe bridge housing where our most vulnerable can recuperate after an emergency room or hospital discharge. Upstairs, we have the Illumination Foundation Medical Group, an on-site medical office with a primary care doctor. IFMG also has a lab on location to help provide holistic medical care where our clients reside. We also have behavioral health offices and an on-site dentist. The work we do here wouldn't be possible without the support of the community and all those who are dedicated to disrupting the cycle of homelessness. The unique thing about this um, particular facility that it was public-private funding, a private investor purchased it, we paid them back, and now we have all different kinds of programs that go through there. There's approximately 150 individuals that are in there, and it, we move people through um, pretty rapidly once they come in and we address some, some or or most of their problems. So if you look at the second model that we came up with, it was the hub and spoke model. And for example, the 410 model would have been the hub. And so we realized that you could do great work in medical respite, but people had to, our clients had to continue to move through that continuum. So we really had to address where they went after medical respite and not right back to the street. So we started looking at individual six bedroom homes um, around the facility, we call these spokes, and we started buying all these houses that were around the hub. And again, we used a private social investment fund to buy those houses. And I'll show you a little bit at the end um, what that looks like. But each one of the homes, we, we moved six people at one time. And if it's families, obviously it's family, but some clients have mental health issues, substance abuse, and seniors. We have quite a few senior houses now because it is the fastest growing population of senior women. The next slide will show you just an example of some of the micro communities. Um, there's six to eight people in each one of these houses, um, and they really do quite well once they get in there. This, for all intents and purposes, could be their final stop. Many of our, our clients it is, but some go on to apartments and uh, are, are well enough to go into you know, living by themselves. But most of our clients enjoy living together with other people and the social benefits from that. 
So these are the spokes, the hubs are the, the uh, navigation medical respite. And so, you know, I just read this um, great article in the New York Times uh, talking about housing and homeless in Los Angeles um, and how money was just so much money went into housing, but yet it didn't answer the, the problem. And we agree. And we realized that we had that model, which is a hub and spoke, but we are also looking for other ways, modular housing. This happens to be a roto molded factory housing that could be put together in 48 hours. And these sheets on the right, they come from the factory and it puts together like a Lego, um, like a little Lego kit. The, all the electricals on top, the plumbing's on the bottom. And this particular facility, there are 17 individuals that have HUD vouchers that live in that, um, the, the building on the right. And so that was an example, and, and we're scaling that up throughout the US of one, um, you know, just an alternate housing plan. And it was the first plastic building material that is allowed to be used in the US now. That's what the rooms look like. They have their own little bathroom shower, they have a desk and it's all shared, um, you know, they're all shared um, uh, kitchen and dining common area. And again, now we're looking at ADUs to go, you know, granny flats, what they call them in the backyard. We purchased a couple houses and then put these in the backyard uh, to expand the footprint and provide more housing. So, you know, you none of this would have been possible without funding. Um, I always laugh when I look at this, um, this investment structure because my wife won't even let me handle our checkbook. So um, I look at this model and I, I, I told our CFO, I'm a nurse. I'm not a, uh, um, I'm not a um, investment banker, but fortunately our CFO was an investment banker. So this is a model and an example where you have social family foundations that donate money. They get 5% back. And we were able to buy all these properties and Illumination Foundation is the manager. So they get part of the investment. And it's a program we're starting on our second fund um, uh, in the new year. And we see it as a way to use um, a lot of the social entrepreneurship and the funding that's available to serve this population. And Lauren's gonna to talk to you a little bit, again, without the funding, you can't do it. You can't really operate, no, no money, no mission. But again, if you don't have the data, you're not gonna be able to really show what you can do. And so Lauren will talk to you a little bit about the data that we have collected over the years. And we have both learned so much about data. So both Paul and I were the nurses with um, Excel sheets and pieces of paper and counting things by hand with no data analytics support in the beginning. So we know what it's like um, to try to get data when you're under resourced, but we also know how powerful it is when you have it. So these, these are just a couple of key snapshots about the model that Paul created. So this is on more than a thousand patients and you can see here a 70% increase in um, accessing primary care, which is what you really want to see in a population that's stabilizing. Next slide, please. And these are the numbers that matter to payers, to health systems, to any of the government. We saw an appropriate reduction in emergency room visits and hospital admissions because of that integrated model. Healthcare, behavioral health, substance use treatment is woven throughout the um, homeless services from the shelter all the way to those micro communities. So people really don't need to go to the emergency room, their pain management needs, their anxiety, it can be met, integrated in that system. So appropriate reductions, next slide. 
also a really nice reduction in costs. So payers care about per member per month costs. Uh, it's a good, good measure for you to think about with your innovation and program. And we saw great shifts here. Next slide, please. And most importantly, the entire country is turning its head towards total cost of care. <laughs> and this, we'll talk a little bit about this. But what the payer saw for this population is a $17 million reduction in costs. That's significant. That's freeing up 17 million that can be invested in other things for wholeness and health and really changing root causes. Next slide. So what we're doing now is a ton of work around the country, a lot in California. Uh, Medicaid is, be, is redesigned in California where it's paying for things like recuperative care and um, post-hospitalization, um, short-term housing and tenancy and supports and complex care management. It is a land of opportunity for nurses. So we're working with sites um, in California, but also around the country to actually take that expert team that we have who we've delivered we know what it's like, and we've done consulting to really land a team in areas that want to start these kind of models and really help you do rapid startup, accessing that expertise, and then walking with you um, through the implementation. We know your experts. We know communities are experts at what they do. Um, working with people who've walked the path before you can make that implementation faster and, and help you realize the dream in the way that you want to see it with that expert advisor to help you. Next slide. Um, if you don't pay attention to federal government, this is a time to pay attention. CMS and CMMI released their new strategy this year, and it is a time of opportunity. So there's a deep focus on equity underserved populations and by 2030 they would like to see all medicare and the majority of medicaid beneficiaries in a total cost of care model what does that mean things are going to flip from being focused on how many more visits can you bill for to how can we actually improve quality how can we look holistically and there's also a lot of talk and foundational work around shifting dollars to the community to build out social services and supports and to really um, look at the structures that will pay for and incentivize cross-sector collaboration. In addition, it's a time where multiple disciplines have a very important role to play at the top of their license. Nurses, pharmacists, social workers, community health workers, peers, it's gonna take all of us to address the complexity that's happening in our communities, that's happened as um, a result of the pandemic, and it's a natural time for nurses to step forward. Next slide. Um, this is just to give you a taste. In California, this is an overview of just a few of the incentive dollars that are available from the state government, as well as leftover American Rescue Clinic dollars related to the pandemic and federal dollars. So these dollars are being distributed in California to build out capacity for care management, to build out the capacity to deliver homeless services, to build out the capacity to really enhance behavioral health, to address student behavioral health. It's really a time where it's a tremendous opportunity for nurses to lead in the space and the dollars are available from a very different source than they've ever been in my career. Next slide. So think about connected communities of care. You know the patient, the client story. You're there, you see it. Our education prepared us to look holistically at a person in the context of their community and what matters most to them. This is our time to bring that knowledge to the forefront. Next slide. We want to encourage you to lead the way. Our country needs you, our communities need you, and we need that vision and that action for our families and children going forward. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our work and 
we'd like to open it up for um, questions and dialogue. Really interested in knowing what will help you most to pursue the dream and innovation that you're working on. Thank you so much, Lauren and Paul. At this time, I'm gonna take some questions from the chat. So if we can start with the question from Dan Peshett, how is this work being communicated to wider audiences? It's a great question, Dan. Um, so uh, there's a few different ways. So I was uh, named co-chair of PTAC um, this year. So it's a body that vets models for payment for HHS and CMMI and CMS. So Paul presented um, to PTAC, which so HHS, CMMI, CMS hearing it. Um, we're also working on more publishing. We wanna get this out even more. And um, also really open to where you think the best angle of intersection is. And Paul, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that we're, as you said, we're starting to do a few more white papers, including the data. So we have another round of data coming out. Um, that was just a glimpse of, of some of the data that we've collected. Um, but now we can do, um, prescriptive analytics and we can do so much in AI where nurses before, you know, when when I was out working as public health nurse in the community, I was having to fill out five or six pages of, of check boxes that our clients wouldn't sit there and do that. Now I can use three key data points and with the English, English language reader, it can put all that in there for me. So we're really using that kind of stuff to, to really let people know um, some of the models that are working. And this is um, Ori, and just building on that question, that's a question that came through privately, but you know, question around, you know, uh, also around kind of communication of, of these ideas, broader audiences. Um, when you're, how can you communicate this more broadly and, or how are you communicating this to legislators at the state uh, and national levels? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause one of the things that I had to learn right away, you know, 15 years ago, I hadn't had a lot of political um, knowledge of working with cities, counties, states, um, I do now after 15 years because, you know, policy is so important. And, you know, when we're talking to legislators, both Lauren and I, uh, you know, speak to them quite often, you know, they, they want solutions, but you also have to find out to them what's really important to them. And it has to make sense. So it was really exciting because about a year and a half ago, I got to speak to our governor um, New, uh, Newman in California, and I was able to talk to him about medical respite and show him some of the data, and um, he took that and formed a couple committees that we were able to advise on. That's wonderful. A question from Amanda, with 90 beds in one location, how did you manage interpersonal conflicts between residents? Yeah, it, that's a great question too, because, you know, when we first started, it was like, uh-oh, we had, and this was years ago, right? We have all these people, um, all these clients that they have, you know, some mental health, substance abuse, and they were all under one roof. Uh, but we just got better and better at understanding our clients, and we built out the models one thing Lauren said when she first came to visit Fullerton, how quiet was, how quiet it was, and how organized it was. So that particular um, facility, 38% of our staff, we have about 400 staff, were previously homeless. So they really understand what our clients are going through. And we set up, it, it's low barrier and it's harm reduction. But we do make sure our clients are accountable. And we have, you know, a lot of staff. We have a lot of staff using psych techs, EMTs, people that are there 
when our clients need them 24 seven. And that really added to our expertise to really manage a facility with 150 people in there. Wonderful. And Lauren and Paul, some folks in the chat wondering if you have sites in Texas or sites in Michigan. Yeah, so I actually started in Michigan. So worked in Grand Rapids and then also with Muskegon. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to go to the next level in Michigan um, and would love to work more there. I, I live there most of my life and I moved to Kentucky um, about six years ago when I started with the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs. So love Michigan very much. And Paul, um, what's on the line related to Texas? Well, we've worked a lot in Texas, but we just started really scaling up in June of this year. And it seems like we've been doing this for a couple of years, scaling up, but um, we have a really great group of people working with National Healthcare for the Homeless. I'm actually on their board for the second time. And all the FQHCs that we're working with, and then um, as Lauren alluded to earlier, we're working with AARP. And AARP and the Center for Nursing Health Equity. So we have these three layers. So Texas is one of the places where I just talked to somebody and would probably make a visit there to again, stand up a, to us, medical respite is kind of the hub and you can do so much once you have one set up um, to really help the community. So that that is one place on our radar. Wonderful. And a comment from Dan, how can we get you invited to CNN for an interview or other news media outlets, which I think is probably echoed by everyone on this uh, lounge. I think we need to ask Shauna that. I know Shauna will know. <laughs> I love, actually, can I pipe in, Olivia? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I actually want to start with a question for, for Paul. Um, it, it, let me, uh, let me, it's going to sound a little bit provocative. I'm known for that. Um, huh. my wish when I read about your background, um, what comes through is the CEO is the leader in doing some really extraordinary things. What doesn't come through, it's just barely in there is that you are a nurse and mm -hmm. a lot of your insights came from that. And so when you're doing this outreach, or you're there as a leader in all of this, so many people don't see nurses as this is something that nurses can do. This is nurses is something that they should be doing. Then there's a whole host of nurses who might like to approach you that, ah, uh, you know, it's a CEO of this huge foundation. They're not going to have the time of day. I think leading with nurse could be an incredible calling card for more people coming through to chat with you. And also um, setting up that example of what nurses actually do. And I see this so many times when nurses oftentimes transition a heavy clinical role into something that is more system. They tend to drop those designations or those licensures or that identification. And nurses, people don't, the public doesn't see that these are things that nurses can be doing and should be doing and have done. So that's a little bit of my, um, my wish so that we can get that out there. But then as far as getting on, you know, things like CNN, it really is developing relationships with our media partners, the op-ed pieces. Um, I'm seeing increasingly where op-ed projects and reporters, there's that whole section of health media, um, Diana Mason, Barbara Glickstein, they're all involved with that. We need to be cultivating better media relationships, ha just hands down across the board nurses and nursing, we need to be doing that. So I'm here to help. Right. No, <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, I do identify myself as a nurse and I started doing it more and more because when I was scaling up Illumination Foundation, it was working with other CEOs. Um, now I'm more saying, you know, I, I'm a nurse. And when I first started, you know, I'd speak at a lot of nursing schools. I was telling nurses, when I first walked in, 
I didn't know you needed a board for to start a nonprofit. My son said, hey, dad, you can't just talk, you need a board. And I joke because I asked neighbors, friends, I asked my gardener and he was too busy. And now 10 years later, we have Disney on our board, Kaiser, we have the CEOs from all those companies. And I, you know, it, it's a Fortune 500 board of directors. And I talk to them as a lens from nursing. They, they know that. And at first I thought, wow, I'm not qualified to do this. And then, you know, as it went through, I realized I'm really qualified to do this because I'm a nurse and we understand how to do care plans, how to manage clients and patients, how to set daily goals. And there's not much difference in what I was doing with the Illumination Foundation. It, it's basically the same work. And of course, you know, the compassion and being able to understand our clients and these vulnerable populations that we work for and just the horrific conditions that they're, they're under. And I don't know of anybody else better than a nurse that could understand that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And like I said, in those early stages, oftentimes nurses walk in and, and executive levels don't take them seriously because they have a very narrow understanding of what nurses are capable. So there is a period oftentimes where you know, sometimes it doesn't help to lead. Now you are at this stage of success. I hope that's the first word out of your mouth. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. It, it really is. And the story of our clients, because nurses are really good at telling stories for their patients and being an advocate for them. And that's kind of what I learned early on. And I, I do do a lot of presentations. And so it always starts and ends with the client. And the fact that, you know, I'm a nurse. Another great question from Anna. Um, how did you navigate the risk and compliance evaluation of this program? And how long did that piece take? I think there's probably two versions of that, right? Um, so Anna, when I was starting that model in Trinity and um, linking across sectors, sharing behavioral health, substance use information, trying to collaborate with people that were competitors. It set off all the alarm bells. And then every population I was caring for is in the highest risk populations for any kind of IRB review. So um, from the very beginning, I included risk on a um, and compliance on a collaborative that met weekly to discuss the model, discuss the work that we were doing with clients, develop the tools and resources. And so I engaged them right away on the client story. Things that are happening to people are egregious. This should not be happening. And we need your voice. We need your help building this in a way where it's supported. And then uh, eventually went all the way to the top of Trinity, which is a 96 hospital system to meet with their lawyers, risk and compliance, and then actually spoke at the National Covaris Risk Compliance Conference, again, to try to engage people, not say, oh, you're the discipline, we don't want you involved, <laughs> you're the people that ruin everything for us, <laughs> but to say, come into our fold, it's interprofessional, we need your expertise to help us build this for the vulnerable people we're trying to care for, because some of why things happen to them is people perceive that they can't collaborate because of 42 CFR, because of risk and compliance, and that's a crime. People deserve to be seen holistically. How did you do that, Paul, with all the, I mean, you're in every space too. Yeah, you know, well, the big thing for, you know, we were one of the pioneers for medical respite. So we had a significant footprint in Los Angeles. And one day there was a knock on the door and uh, we had nine, an auto bus men, pharmacy, medical, nine people from Sacramento walking and saying, what are 150 people? What is this place? Like, it, you, you don't have Title 22. You're not a hospital. I said, no, each one of these patients has their own doctor and we're coordinating this. 
So they stayed a month with us and looked through every one of the charts and um, we thought, oh, they're gonna tax us heavy or force us to get licensure. And they said, wow, this is pretty good. And so, you know, taking that risk to do that non-conventional, because if you walk into a medical respite, it looks like pretty much like a hospital, right? But you don't need the onerous licensing. You can take care of people quicker, more efficient, and you can do multiple things. You're not burdened with all the, the back-end licensure. So, uh, but we, we are now trying to get more regulations, get more certifications, just so that we can really have best practices in medical respite. But it, it was pretty risky at first because um, no one really knew what it was. Oh, and there were some uh, some kind of some observations from um, just in comments in the chat around the structure that you're talking about, which um, the parallel between the work that you're doing um, in the community around um, essentially staging that the public health the public health model can almost look like a step down unit, depending on which group that you're you're working with. If you were to parallel that against an acute care uh, facility. Um, and one of the other uh, comments that came through around restrictive, you talked about the regulatory components, uh, risk compliance, but also the restrictive billing. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I hate to say it because people get all jealous, but California now with CalAIM, they're wanting to engage uh, community-based organizations. So most of our work right now is trying to help community-based organizations understand billing, understand how to set up, you know, because we were doing uh, Medicare billing already in different parts of medical respite, and we had the infrastructure to be able to do that. Most CBOs don't have, community-based organizations don't have that experience, so, but they can get it, and, you know, the, you know, I always tell nonprofits that we're working with, it's better to at least try. And it's better to make sure, um, you know, if we're talking about somebody who's mentally ill and on the street and medically fragile, is it better to leave them on the street? Because, you know, we have hundreds of people dying each night in the US, or is it better to make that effort, make that investment? ask for the, the mentorship and do things that normally weren't in your scope, but you're probably better qualified to do that than most. And especially if you're in nursing. And then outside of California. So, you know, in all those 30 states, the majority of them didn't have a cal -Aim. So there are many different versions of how you can learn to build the value case and find the partners who will invest in what you're doing. And there's several resources that we shared with um, Ori and the team that they can share with you, including a whole toolkit about how to learn how to build the value case. You can find the, the money from cost avoidance. You can find it from another lane with cities and counties who care about equity and other issues. You can find it from private investors and then from the governmental level, um, there's just a lot of energy around expanding waivers. So look and see if your state is working on a Medicaid waiver, because these, these dollars and these types of programs are coming. And then there are some codes you can build as a nurse, not nurse practitioner advanced practice, but as a nurse. Um, so really learning how can you maximize from a 360 degree level the way you can finance the work that you want to see? And that was another question in the chat too, is around Medicaid managed care. Um, have you been able to utilize that within um, the work that you've been doing? Yeah, you know, there, there a lot of the payers now are looking at carve outs and being able to you know, they understand we're in this together. Now, like Lauren said, more than ever. You know, 10 years ago, our, all our managed care companies, they, 
they worked with us, but not like they're working with us now. Um, and to, they want, they know that we're taking care of really vulnerable populations and it is in their best interest to help us. And, you know, if you can show again with the data that you are a quadruple aim, you know, nonprofit and you're hitting those, those goals and it's cost effective, they're going to give you added funding. And, and we found that a lot with the Illumination Foundation because this last couple of months, they just have really uh, been able to grow because it's set up to, to grow and see more patients, take care of more patients um, more adequately and, and just really do good care um, that wasn't there before. And it is because of the payment model. And there is happening right now. So one of the projects I'm working on is with all of the MCPs in all the managed Medicaid plans in California. So there's an incentive program that's $1.2 billion that the plans can earn to invest in communities, but they have to reduce homelessness in their members and increase housing retention and increase street outreach. So they're meeting together, Anthem, Blue, um, Aetna, HealthNet, Kaiser, Molina. They're meeting together to make investments and plans. And the rest of the country is looking at that because what they'll learn is what happens when plans actually invest in these complex problems together, what works, and what doesn't, and how can that be replicated? Because it's a tremendous force when they come together. And I, you know, Paul, you had mentioned um, kind of in your, as you were doing your introduction, talking about um, if you only, uh, if you knew how hard it was going to be, would you have ever, would you have ever started down this path? And you know, when you think about the individual work that you both have done and now coming together to, to advance this, um, lessons learned, right? Some of the most important lessons learned. Um, I'm curious if you can share those with, with everybody on the call. Yeah, I, I usually tell people, I can tell you better what not to do than what, you know, starting on what to do, because it really was trial and error a lot. And um, you know, really kind of always going back to the client and saying, or, and the patient saying, what do they need and what do they want? And then working backwards. But, you know, it, we took on the hardest clients, people that were substance abuse disorder, mentally ill and homeless. So it, it's not like you're dealing with children or baby seals. It's a nonprofit that you really have to learn how to advocate and, you know, really it, it is hard work, but as most of us that went into nursing, it's such a rewarding work just because, you know, to see somebody's life really turn around and to give them comfort and watch them move into an apartment and be able to sustain it. And again, like I said, 38% of our staff of over 400 were previously homeless. We have one medical respite. Um, I don't know if it's still that way, but it was run by all individuals that were previously homeless, including the nurse and our part-time physician that had all experienced homelessness. So it, it just is so rewarding. Um, and so we learned really on kind of, you know, I, I don't know if, if we'd be as cavalier now, we kind of learned that it's hard to go into communities and you're not the white knight coming to save everybody, but finding out what's important to that community. And now that the need is so great that um, we're getting a lot more welcomes than, than before. Well, and it kind of builds upon, um, and 
you know, I, I, Lauren, we want to hear, hear your, um, hear your thoughts as well, but just to kind of to weave in Paul, as you, you mentioned that uh, comment in the chat, part of it was around funding, um, thinking about needing to be sustainable within three years, um, comment in the chat um, from Louisa, um, really is talking about, you know, the grants, um, some of the grants that you're talking about, you know, thoughts about accessibility um, for startups in that space and being able to access that funding. Yeah, and I think that was the, for us, the key, um, because you really can't, unless you have funding, it's really hard to do, um, do this work. You really have to find out, find out, a sustainable uh, source of income, and, and, but it's out there, it really is. I mean, the really incredible thing we learned is people wanna help and there's corporations that really wanna help. You just have to learn how to communicate with them so that they'll fund things that you have aligned goals with. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right, Louisa, the, um, some of the big grants, you do have to have a professional grant writer, but there are other lines, like what's happening in California is there's incentive payment program funds to help people who are doing startups in this space, like help them get this work going and get coaching on how to do it, or even coaching and grant writing for all of these uh, federal dollars that are available right now. And then there's different lanes. There's equity accelerators, startup accelerator. There are um, private foundations that look differently and, and have different uh, rigor in their grant applications compared to a federal grant application or some of the big like Robert Wood Johnson and uh, Commonwealth types. So the dollars are out there and getting some coaching around what might be the constellation that works for you can be really helpful. Um, it's not easy though. I mean, I went through many times in starting up an innovation and keeping it going where, and so did Paul, you know, we worked a million hours and we still kind of do, <laughs> but, but um, we care, I care very deeply about this population. Um, so there was a, an investment that we made as well um, to move the work forward. So, so a lot of the skills that you talked about, you know, in building these resources, um, again, any um, requests for any links or thoughts, um, groups to, that you'd recommend um, that would be wonderful and appreciated by the group. When you think about the work in this space um, and the role of nurses, right? So both of you have commented you know, about um, your backgrounds, how nursing has informed this work. What do you think, um, when you think about, you know, everything, you know, when you, we look at the state of our nursing across the United States, right, the system, healthcare, you know, ecosystem has been disrupted across the board. What are your thoughts about nurses entering this space, nurses navigating away from um, acute care facilities into community population health, um, your own journey in that space? What do you think about the future of the workforce and, and what what's happening in, across the healthcare ecosystem and, and future roles and opportunities for the nursing profession. Paul, do you wanna take that first? Yeah, you know, definitely, I've always looked at nurses as leaders because I've worked with so many nurses in ICU, ER, and in the community. So I, I really, you can see right before our eyes that I think when I started as a nurse, the length of stay in the hospital was like nine days. Now it's like, you know what, 0.5, you have a baby and drive through and you're out of there. So, so much is, is being done out in the community. And I think for a lot of nurses, they, you know, they haven't really seen all the opportunities that are out there and that, you know, exposure to leadership, being on boards, you know, there's such a valued voice that I, I think that's just, um, you know, paramount right now to make sure that there is just different opportunities that you might have gotten tired of working 
in a, a acute care setting and that you want to try something different. I really think public health and community health now more than ever is needed. And, and I think I saw somebody about um, asked about some links. AARP and that Center for Health Equity just is going, they're looking for nurse innovators who want to um, try a program, what, whatever it is. And it's um, a $50,000 um, grant that, that they'll work with you on it. It's not a regular grant. So, and that's kind of what they're having me do too, is work with nurses to help them expand that money and, and do the leadership part. So there's one right there that just came out. So if you, if you have a great idea and you really want, think it'll, it'll work, um, there's funding available. And then uh, when you think about roles, so I think the land of what is possible for nurses in the community is so vast and so important right now. I used to think it was traditional, like you work in the hospital or you work for public health, like the county, um, the public health department, or you work for a home care agency. But now that land is really broad. So you can work with um, an insurance company really managing a population. You can work with an ACO or a value-based payment um, model where you're managing a population in the community. You can lead and be part of an array of nonprofit organizations. You can be partnered with a faith community and really impacting populations. You can start your own service like mobile health care. <laughs> Nurses are doing that in the community really successfully. So you can start an app. <laughs> There's nurses doing that for behavioral health. So it's incredibly broad, um, the areas where you can have an impact. And I think it's needed that uh, more nurses are in that space. Lauren, Paul, I, I do want to follow up on that because we're, we're having conversations with a lot of nurses and health systems. And a lot of nurses would really like to be out in the community. They don't necessarily want to go be in, in a hospital type of setting. But what they hear repeatedly is they won't hire them into these community <laughs> settings unless they've had a minimum of a year in a health system. And so that pipeline of nursing programs having more cl clinical placements within the community so that those community partners can see Here's somebody that's interned with us and we feel really good about bringing them on board. Could you speak more to how, um, what are your thoughts about how we get over that catch 22? I have a big personal bias about this and I'll tell you a backstory. So I don't have a year of hospital experience. I ruptured two discs in my back before I took my nursing boards. So I became a nurse, I passed my boards and had two back surgeries and could not clinically work on a hospital floor because I couldn't stand or lift patients. And it took me almost a year to heal from the chronic pain from that. So all of my experience started in the community. And then I went back into the hospital in unusual roles like starting a palliative care program or running really a consult service. So I had the knowledge, but I never worked on a floor. I think that the demand for community-based work is going to overcome that um, requirement. Paul, I'm really curious what you think, because you, I mean, you've been to yeah. all extremes of the, of the clinical phase. Well, I, you know, it, it is different work. However, you know, with the Illumination Foundation, we, we needed 100 employees. We are 100 employees short. And, you know, we worked with a lot of nursing schools. We worked with new, you know, new grads. We actually, the person that helped me set up the first clinic, it was so funny because she graduated from UCI. And I said, have you had any experience with uh, community health or running a clinic? And she said, no, I just graduated. I said, you're perfect. Um, <laughs> and and she, she actually works at Stanford now and runs their 
outpatient clinics, but her and her twin sister both work for me. So I think right now there's just so much need. And I, I just, you know, when every time I talk to nurses, I didn't, you know, because I worked at Life Flight and ER, just that adrenaline junkie. I didn't know if I'd like public health, but it was so much to me. You're helping so many people at one time. It was pretty incredible. You could see that that needle moving. So I always tell nursing students when I speak at their classes, you know, look at everything, you know, look at all aspects because, um, you know, it's just such a variety. And I think, you know, it, nursing school prepares you well to entry level position, whether it's, you know, at an acute hospital or in a community setting. And there's some really, really good community settings now where you get to do a variety of work. So to me, that that's what's exciting. And there's some comments in the chat um, about um, essentially how can we embed these um, opportunities in into the NCLEX, into nursing school experiences. And um, just to, if people haven't seen it, the you know 2022 AACN um, essentials also include population health. Um, and so again, some systems-based practice. So some of these concepts, which you know, interprofessional practice, um, you know, person-centered care. So as we're seeing some of this pivot in the education system, you guys have already been modeling what that looks like um, through your work. So it's just, well, I'll drop that in the chat too for everyone. What, um, what do you think about, you know, the financial um, acumen that nurses need? Um, we dropped into the chat, uh, the ROI calculator. You talked about, you know, what are those, you know, are there specific metrics that really um, will help make your case? How do you choose those metrics? Um, and just what, what do nurses need to do to prepare? You know, they're already out of school. They're already working. They want to transition to this space. What, how, how should nurses prepare to begin doing this work? Um, do they just jump in or are there things that would, um, you know, give them that skill set to be, to be even more successful? I think one of the most powerful skills or tools you can build in your toolkit is really understanding how to make the value case. I started, I led in the beginning with a, a value case around this shouldn't happen to people. This is what is happening to this person. This is what's happening to our team. And that got me a certain distance. But when I got to the wall where I couldn't explain the economics of it, and I couldn't show the outcomes in the context of the systems I was talking to, they couldn't hear me anymore because they were charged with making the money work. And so once I learned how to make that value case, it was like learning a whole nother language and opening up a whole land of countries I could travel to and opportunities that could happen that mattered because I could make a difference for this population that I cared so deeply about. Um, and then when I met Paul, um, so Paul teaches me a lot because Paul knows a lot as well about how to generate partnerships um, for different sources of revenue. And that was not familiar to me. So Paul, do you wanna comment about that? Yeah, I, you know, I really love working with nurses and new nurses and even new staff members and have them write a budget and write a grant. You really learn so much by doing. And, you know, there again, it could be as sophisticated as you want. Some of the grants, we just finished one, Lauren and I recently, but, you know, it, it could be a small grant is really similar to a $100 million grant, you know, but you really have to think through operations and nurses are good. They, they know what they need. Like they know what you would need to take care of somebody. And it's just learning hands-on. It was funny, I, I went to NBA school and I ended up hiring people from Stanford, Harvard, um, UCLA, 
Berkeley, and I went to Compton College. And so I was the CEO and they were all working, you know, under me and they understood that, but they didn't understand nursing and they didn't understand how that puzzle uh, pieced together. So I would say, don't be intimidated to them by on finances because it could, it scares a lot of people that are thinking, oh, I can't do that. Um, but, but you can, and you can, you can pick that up and learn that. Um, and so I, I always like the old adage, just learn by doing, you know, get in there, roll your sleeves up and do a couple budgets. And partner, um, like Paul said too, I ended up partnering with the CFO at the organization where I worked because I got in trouble. I was reducing income producing utilization in the people I was caring for. I thought I was doing good. <laughs> Their use of the ER in, in hospital retail, but I was reducing revenue for the hospital, which I didn't understand. So he partnered with me. And so I was like, whatever you can learn now, but who else can you partner with to take you even farther? You know, I'm first generation American. I didn't learn finance like this in my family. It was partnered, learning it step at a time and then practicing. And it will get you the things that you want to, the change, the tools to make the change that you want to see. Lauren and Paul, I have a question. So in talking to some nurse innovators, some of them have commented that they understand the importance of networking and that partnership you're talking about, but they don't necessarily know who they should be partnering with. Those, those roles that you wish you would have known about maybe in the beginning of your journey. So any um, certain roles that you would call out or, or certain networks that have been um, the most beneficial in your journeys? Well, I talk to everybody and it's so funny because people that you think, well, you know, just that human interaction of talking to people, asking them, you know, what do you do? Where, why are you here? Whether it's a conference and really putting yourself out there. I think a lot of times people just think, oh, that person doesn't want to talk to me, but people that I wouldn't have even suspected as later coming and really helping us scale, I, I probably wouldn't have talked to them other than the fact that I met them somewhere and they either call me or I called them back. So I, I, um, I guess it's best because Aaron, my assistant always said, do you ever say no? And I said, no, <laughs> I just, I don't say no. And I talk, I'll talk to anybody like, you know, because I, I think that's really what you have to do is just network and and put yourself out there um, because, you know, the people that you don't think might be able to help you can end up helping you the most. And I would just add a couple of formal structures. So, you know, all the work that Ori and ANA with innovation is doing is built in Shauna and J and J and American Academy of Nursing with Edgerners tap into those innovation communities. Um, the first most helpful thing that happened for me is through AAN, Diana Mason reached out and offered to create a kitchen table cabinet for me. So um, she linked to the people that she thought would be able to help me learn things the most, and they would get on a call at the drop of a hat to advise me because I was getting pulled into rooms where I, I didn't even know how to read up and prepare for it. So I went from clinically delivering to getting called into the top of a 96 hospital system into the glass box office to do a five minute presentation to try to get their research. Like, I don't even know how to think like this at the time. And the politics, you know, um, how things worked even in, in Ivy League academia. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know some of the, how the government worked in different ways for funding. So they would advise. And then the other most important people, I think, were lawyers, which sounds horrible, but from an intellectual property standpoint and a protection of your work and how to take that forward, 
having a lawyer that you can trust that will advise you because it's very important, especially for nurses or any other population that traditionally has not been highlighted as the leaders and owners of innovation for you to know how to protect yourself in the work that you're doing. Um, I would say those were intellectual property lawyer, kitchen table cabinet, and then anybody who's doing work like what you want to do, don't be afraid, like Paul said, just write them out of the blue and say, hey, would you talk to me for half an hour? Um, most people love talking about what they do, and they'll say yes, even if they don't know you from Adam. And lots of lots of support in the chat, um, you know, for both of you. And you know, I think about um, the work of, you know, even some of the people in our chat who are already embedded in communities. Are you, you know, comment from Bobby talking about CDC, are you guys partnering with um, other uh, federal or kind of health agencies outside of HHS? Are you working with CDC, any other groups like that? Yeah, it's funny you say that because last week I was at a conference and uh, uh, somebody from the CDC presented and I went up and talked to her and gave her a brief outline of what we were doing and she goes oh we want to get in the community more you've got to fill out an application and she called me that night and said I want to make sure in 2023 we need to work with more community-based organizations and we haven't traditionally done that and so we want to work with you so I was like, wow, that was because I didn't, you know, I wouldn't have even thought to go to them. Um, but so, yeah, it looks like in 2023, we're going to do some work with them. Bobby, that's right up your alley. Are you hearing that? Um, you're popping some comments in the chat here for the group too. Um, so when you think about, you know, these federal agencies who are looking for these kind of ways to become embedded in the community, um, you're bridging and becoming translators and connectors um, across the board. Are, you know, what are the, any surprises in this space um, that you've had to navigate as you've been working to build these bridges, make connections, um, anything that's, you know, you know, because both of you are so experienced, anything that's caught you off guard or, um, you know, that made you pause and, and you know, think about um, how to navigate next steps? Well, I, I know the one thing, we work with HHS a lot and Secretary Becerra came in on a tour to see our facility, um, but it never ceases to amaze me how slow governmental agencies work, even though it wasn't a surprise, but yet it was because, you know, you really have to take, you know, it's something you're not going to do with them overnight. It really has to be a calculated plan. And once you get connected to them, you know, they can do great things, but it really is a slow moving um a process when you're working with these bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. I think the other lesson too was don't give up when you run into competition. So I didn't like that part of it. <laughs> I didn't realize that sometimes I would get into a space and I would I would have all the data and I would the outcomes and I'd have the awesome partnerships and all the things but someone else was competing for more attention for what they were doing and they had a stronger power base in that scenario. And um, so don't give up when that happens because good work will rise to the top and it will get recognized, but it does happen and it will, you'll run into those places, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Such good advice, and and again, right? I think you know the that that saying, the bumpy road is the path, right? <laughs> yeah, one of the funny stories I heard well, it wasn't really funny, but it was unique in the fact that one guy, when we started working in nonprofits, we thought everybody was going to like us. Hey, we we're helping the homeless, and this one guy brought me aside and said, you know, firemen. When they fight a fire, they're like, 
they see another unit and they're happy to see them come. That's not the way it is with, you know, nonprofits and homeless. They'll say, this is my fire, you find your own. And so it was kind of true because you thought, well, this is such needed work and, you know, uh, but it, there's a lot of competition and mainly because it's funding. So they're in it for the same funding dollars that you are. And they believe in their nonprofit or what they're doing just as much as you do. So I agree with Lauren 100%, just don't give up um, because a lot of our work came from people saying, oh, I could do this, but then they really couldn't. And then we would, we would get a contract anyway. And find a group that you can be honest with and cry and get really angry when that does you. <laughs> so, so you have the motivation to keep going <laughs> if it does happen. Yeah. And sometimes you just need a release valve, right? So, you know, yes. just, right? And then you can keep going. You gotta, like, yeah, take take the take the pressure off for just yeah. a moment. <laughs> Well, I, I open this up to, you know, we've had such a, a wonderful conversation tonight. Um, any other questions from um, attendees, you know, please drop those in the chat. Um, and uh, also some additional, um, just um, Shauna dropped a, a comment in the, in the chat for, you know, for attendees, um, you know, Lauren and Paul, thank you so much um, for all of the incredible work that both of you are doing. Um, and you're an inspiration to, to all of us. Um, you know, lots of lessons learned to, to be taken away from this conversation. And, and you know, we, at, um, you know, in the innovation space at the American Nurses Association, we're very lucky because Lauren um, also sits on our innovation advisory board. Um, and, you know, really to be able to bring in her expertise as we're looking to build out the work of, of innovation across the nursing profession. And, you know, we, we look forward to um, continuing our, you know, our relationship and the conversation um, with Paul and with Lauren as their work advances. Um, we also have this, you know, see, you now podcast, um, there will be an upcoming podcast um, that will also be um, featuring both, um, you know, we'll be featuring this work work as well. So again, um, thank you to everyone for joining tonight. Um, and